oh, about 75, 80 years ago, I think. The same central figure that is down here in the Joseph Smith hypocephali with the two-headed figure is moved up here, but it's only got two heads. And the reason why is because the one head is looking into the past and the other head is looking into the future. And we, in this life, are right between those heads. We are at the point of now. All we have is right now. The past is gone forever. And the future is forever coming. So this is the theme that they're trying to talk about. It embraces all of time. That's why it's in the one eternal round concept. This two-headed figure is strictly correct Egyptologically. The critics used to say Joseph Smith blew it, therefore he's a false prophet. With a little bit of patience and time and effort, we can now say, wrong answer, but thanks for playing, you don't have a clue. <laughs> I love driving this stuff in the critics' mind. Man, I shouldn't, but I do. So there's the two-headed figure. Here's another two-headed figure that just happens to be a ram. It's a very popular iconographic aspect of the Egyptian religion. Don't kid yourself. Joseph Smith didn't get it wrong. Now it's interesting. When I present evidence to this, like this to the critics, and they have said, shirts, how can someone so intelligent as you believe in such superstitious junk as that? Joseph Smith is wrong. He got nothing right. And I say, yes, he did. You know what their response is? Oh, well, I could have guessed that. Do <laughs> you see the problem with that? They didn't guess that. They said Joseph Smith got nothing right. When I show them the evidence and say, wrong answer, he got everything right in that figure, then they say, they agree, they say, Oh, well, yeah, but I could have told you that. That's not the issue. I don't care if you could have guessed it. My point is, Joseph Smith got it right. That's my point. And now you agree with me. You just argued he didn't. They will try to get you to think that way. And they're wrong. There's another one. This is out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This is a real famous picture, actually, uh, out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And I don't know if you can see that, that little boat. This boat theme is really huge. I mean, it's almost in all the hypocephali. Primary. Because, here's why. The, uh, the sun god Ray was the goal. Because the sun, what does the sun do? The sun goes from once, one horizon, all the way across the sky, and he goes on down in the west. And he's dead. He's gone. I mean, he's gone. You look outside right now. You don't see the sun up. It's dead. It's gone. And they knew that the earth was round and that the sun went underneath the earth for 12 hours. And then he was what? <laughs> Reborn. So that image has occurred endlessly. Have you ever seen it any different? I have. Every day the sun comes up. Woohoo! Thank goodness. It's the image of the eternal. It's the image of the rebirth, the resurrection, and eternal life. They view that as a boat. The God in the boat. If you can get into that boat, you've got eternal life. You've got to be. So that's the goal. So that's why this, this two-headed figure, looking back in the past, looking forward in the future, he sees all things all at once. Isn't that the description of the Almighty Father in the Doctrine and Covenants? All things are before my eyes as one eternal Do you remember what section that is? Here, I'm supposed to know this. Anyway, it's in there, I promise. The DNC. Someone look it up quick. I feel like a real stupid... Anyway. Now, here's this figure close up. <laughs> this is so fun. This is so fun. This figure is the Egyptian Khnumeret. He's the creator. He represents the spirit of the four elements. He is the soul of the material world. He is represented in the coffin texts as begotten of the members and created in the heart of the great God. He is the Melech Olam. He is the king of the universe. Joseph Smith said, this is Kolob, the first.
first creation. First in government. First in the measurement of time. Now the critics have made fun of Kolob. They say, oh my gosh, what kind of nincompoopery names can you guys come up with next? We say, well, we'll stick with Kolob. Because through the years, it's dawned on people, the Hebrew for Kelob is to alter, change, turn over, you go flip-flop. It means heart, intellect, or intelligence. Now you start to get the DNC in mind, aren't you? Intelligence, intellect, heart. It's a certain bright star. Here comes... Here comes the astronomy again. We'll never get out of the astronomy with this stuff. Off of Centaur, off of Scorpio, in the 18th mansion of the moon. There's other appellations of other stars. Regulus is called Kalb al-Assad, which is the heart of the lion. The Arabic Kalb is pronounced like Kalb. Denotes the constellation Canis Major, and is the principal star, has, it has Sirius and the star Procyon. The Arabs called Canopus Suhail al in Canopus Ponderosus, a heavy weight. It's the eighth that holds the plumb line, which measures the hours, and hence it's a measurement of time. Joseph Smith said it was a measurement of time. Now let me show you the Egyptological stuff on this. Oh, well. Hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Kolob. Carol means near or approach. Now remember, in the facsimile number two, the definition of Kolob was, it is nearest to the throne of God. It is nearest to the center of God. It is not the center. But it is the main governing principal planet of the system of planets. Right? Kolob also means dog. Kolob means heart, intellect, intelligence. There's the merkit. It's the plumb bob. It weighs the balance of the earth. It holds a middle place among the people of the Centauri. Oh, and Ibn Arbi, I had to write this down because I couldn't type it out. Ibn Arbi, on his, now get this, on his ascent to heaven, this Arab mystic says, in the house of Abraham it's called Kolob because it was near the throne of God. Joseph Smith didn't have Ibn Arbi. That's a perfect description of how Joseph Smith called Kolob. But you could have guessed all that, couldn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Animorphans can. What's your problem? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating, isn't it? They'll say one thing, and then when you show them something, they uh, back off. Rightfully so. Oh, I want to show you this one next. Oh, I'm getting close, aren't I? Now, this is, the, this is what you were asking about, the Egyptological evidence. You know, don't talk to me. Don't testify to Joseph Smith without the evidence. Okay, fine. In the Egyptian, Kanum, this guy, the central figure, number one, is the creator God. Joseph Smith said he's first in creation, first in government, measures time. He's the governor of the house of life. To the Egyptians, they called their temple the house of life. Their temples were considered powerhouses because their axis was lined up with the sun's rising and the sun's setting, and they were also lined up with certain constellations of the stars to put them into alignment with the cosmos. So they call it the house of life. The lord of the land of life. Kanemu, the governor of the house of sweet life. He's called governor. Joseph Smith said he was involved in government. First in government. Now, this is still that same thing. I'm never going to get off this figure nine. There's so much here. Now, I want to remember the original was damaged. Okay? Look at the central figure. You can't see the head. You can't quite make out what this little dude is. There's some kind of a circle here. This guy's crown is completely gone. You're not quite sure what his body looks like. He has no scepter. You can't tell what that figure is very well. And yet here it is exactly drawn with a seated figure with this Tao X with the two heads, the ram's horns. There's a hieroglyph there. There's no hieroglyph over there. These guys are drawn exactly with the moon disks and the sun disks on their head. 